So um, welcome everybody. This is Bob Ose. This is Theater Resources Unlimited. And uh, it's sort of a new thing for us. Uh, for the past two and a half years, we've been doing Zoom meetings. Now that people are edging their way into life again, uh, we're uh, trying to do, uh, trying to do, we are doing, we are doing monthly live panels that have a hybrid um, <laughs> hybrid component. Component. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, hybrid component. So we've got people on Zoom. We've got people in the room. And um, we are doing town halls about issues that are deal that are affecting our social fabric around the country and also around the world. Um, we've done uh, last month. We did. Uh, what did we do? If you were here. Yeah, that was producing theater. What the complications are today yes for not for theaters to produce yeah, exactly but um we're doing gender not, parity yeah. today we've got in january we're, we're going to be doing a um not a hybrid i think we're doing just a, it's just a virtual right yeah we're, we're going to be doing a, vir a virtual town hall about bipoc and issues of diversity and, and trying to create greater diversity and, and equity in our theater and our business and hopefully in our world mm -hmm. um, that's a lot to ask for i think but we're, we're working on it um, so here we are. This is uh, gender parity. Are we there yet? Um, no. <laughs> a, question, a question that particularly comes up during a, a period of time in which Roe versus Wade has been like thrown out by the Supreme Court. So uh, it, 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 an issue that's already sensitive and painful enough has become, I think, a lot more sensitive and a lot more painful. Um, the politics of it and the art that we're involved in. Um, we're going to sort of talk about whether they're interacting um, or whether they're happening independently. And in general, we're going to be inviting our lovely panel to talk about their own personal experiences uh, with uh, the struggle for gender, gender parity, shall we call it. And what we'd like to do tonight is elicit questions from our audience, our Zoom audience and our live audience, uh, find out what it is that you're concerned about and that you'd like to like to find ways of dealing with. Um, but first of all, I want to introduce you to my co-moderators here, my co-panel, my co-hosts. Um, my co-moderator, actually my moderator, I'm her co-moderator, is <laughs> Cheryl Davis. Uh, Cheryl is the founder and um, one of the founders. One of the founders. <laughs> one of the founders. Yes, that's, oh, I did that too, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, One of the founders of TRU. And Cheryl, tell tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, well, well, by day I'm involved in Midtown Manhattan attorney. Mm -hmm. um, by night I am a playwright, librettist, lyricist, television writer. Uh, most recently, I've been writing for Days of Our Lives. Um, so. I feel like I wear a number of hats, and today's hat is co-moderating of a group of professional theater women, dare I say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and did you mention that you're the general counsel for the Authors Guild? I did not. That is part of my day. That is my day career, as I'm the general counsel of the Authors Guild. Um, for those who are unaware, the Authors Guild, once upon a time, the Authors Guild, the Dramatists Guild, and the uh, Writers Guild were all one big guild under the Authors League. Uh, so the dramatist spun off from the dramatist guild, the TV and film writers, and the authors guild is what I call, I like to refer to it as the non-dramatic writers, the book writers, the poets, the essayists, the journalists, those are the members of the authors guild. So I want to also prep you all for, for uh, something that's new tonight. Last month we successfully did a hybrid of live and Zoom, um, but we didn't have a speaker on Zoom. Uh, tonight we actually have Portia McGovern. Portia McGovern, hi. Uh, no, hi. I have to remember to wave oh, yeah, to the way, camera. Sorry. I have to wave this way. I see you here, but I see, you see me here. Um, so uh, we're going to see if we can make that work. I think we're going to be doing speaker view with, uh, with yeah. that as well. Um, and I want you to meet. Um, well, let's start with Portia. Portia, uh, Portia why don't you why don't you introduce yourself to the room? Um, and I think we're going to put you on speaker view. You don't have to. Oh, okay. It's okay. I'm just saying I don't mind seeing all the other people. Um, okay. 
So I'm Portia McGovern. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm on the unceded lands of the Munsee Lenape and Wappinger here in this little corner of Connecticut. And brief visual description, welcome to my pantry office. Um, <laughs> Right. Welcome. You can tell by the Milanos and the gingerbread <laughs> house set up here. Um, I'm a light-skinned Asian American woman with black hair and dark glasses, and I'm wearing a red hoodie because it is quite chilly. And that is not orange. I know it looks orange on Zoom. It's actually amber. My office is amber. Lighting designer, you can tell. <laughs> and I write the um, the series at HowlRound about who directs. No, who designs and directs, see, I was doing it, who designs and directs in Lord Theaters by pronoun. Terrific. Uh, we'll definitely want some of that information shared tonight, so thank you. Um, Cheryl, why don't you introduce the, the rest of our live lineup here? <laughs> well, we'll start by having, we'll start with Lorca. That is. Lorca, can you please tell our studio audience a bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, we all know each other, so uh, just so you know. Uh, my name is Lorca Paris, and I am uh, very happy to be here today. And I have a small theater company called Multi Stages. We are in our 25th year. We just sent out a big e-blast today about saying we're 25 and staying, staying alive. I didn't say that, but I should have. <laughs> um, and uh, I formed it 25 years ago as a woman um, with the intention to bring women playwrights into the fold. I thought it was very important that we all have a voice. Um, it is a multicultural company as well as multidisciplinary. So we do we do new works by BIPOC playwrights and um, various themes and it's very socially conscious work. So that takes up a lot of my life. Uh, although the last year has been very difficult for us, of course. Um, in addition to that, I teach at NYU. I teach script analysis in the Strasbourg studio, and I also teach monologue and audition technique for the Strasbourg Conservatory. So I'm a busy person that way. And I'm also a member of the League of Professional Theater Women. This is how we all know each other. And um, in that capacity, I was the uh, co-president from 2011 to 2014. And I've stayed very involved in the League and I'm currently the development chair. I've been for several years and I'm on the Legacy Council and um, very involved in gender parity and advocating for each other. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Nicely done. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I passed it across. <laughs> this, is, this is our wonderful friend Malini. Yeah. Hi, I'm Malini Singh McDonald, and I'm very happy to be here to be a part of this conversation. Um, I am a director and producer. My pronouns are she, hers, and I identify as Indo-Caribbean, New Yorker first, but uh, my family's from Trinidad, and that is a very big part of my story. I also am a member of the League of Professional Theater Women, and I rolled off as executive vice president. Um, Advocacy and being an anarchist is my passion. <laughs> and so I know fabulous. setting things on fire is so good. <laughs> I, this is being recorded. Yeah, allegedly. She didn't here. say it wasn't legal. She could yeah. be setting things on fire with consent. With consent. <laughs> yeah. So um, in my uh, in my other life. I am the Deputy Chief Diversity Officer of a state agency, so I am living in this discussion of diversity, inclusion, and equity in many different ways. And my story is uh, my husband and I created Black Hannah Productions about almost 20 some of years ago because I just couldn't get work as a director. So I was like, well, I'm gonna create my own work. That's what we're gonna do. And we created that and great opportunity for all of our artists to be able to work in different capacities. And um, so they were forced to just be a playwright or something they could explore it. And then later on, I created Theater Beyond Broadway as a platform to foster the voices and the works of indie theater artists. Great. And that's my story. Great. Hi. Hi. One second. Fanny, can you hide the, uh, the captions on the front? Maybe give us the whole crew. We're just looking at Portia. Oh, yeah, take it off the speaker view. 
Of course, she's saying thank you. And now back to Martha. Uh, I'm Martha Steckety. Uh, I am a uh, dramaturg, which is how I know our, our uh, Ken Cerniglia, who's one of our folks in the in the in the room, um, and a critic. Uh, so the dramaturg, remember the um, literary managers and dramaturgs in the America who've been uh, on their uh, on various committees there. Um, and a critic, I was chair of the uh, American Theater Critics Association for, for a couple of years. I'm still an active member. And I was once a member of the League of Professional Theater Women. And part of what I'm here to talk about today, along with Portia and other folks who do data projects uh, related to parity, is while at the League of Professional Theater Women, Judy Bynas, who's in the room, I had the initial inkling and I then began to work with her while we were both members of the league. She still is, I know. Um, to, and she and I dreamed up the idea of uh, generating a report series. And I've written all of them. There have been six so far. Um, and the league, uh, for the first couple of years, published these reports uh, for the first four, the first four issues. Uh, and there have been two since then. And now it's published on my own website, but the whole series is there in the league history as being the kind of birther of it, which actually is part of the league's legacy of mm -hmm. generating Absolutely. Yes. generative, you know, mm -hmm. and providing the support and beginnings for lots of projects. Um, and that's actually, a, I'm really glad to be in the company of some of my colleagues from those years to uh, kind of thank, give the thanks back that the, it was lovely to have that start there. But this, this that project actually as Judy's initial impulse and I working with her because I have this, uh, we all have these, like you know, what we've done in the past, I was a social science researcher with mm. courts, law courts at the National Center for State Courts for many years. Um, so you have this ability to play with spreadsheets, of course will <laughs> play with spreadsheets and collect data and you think in terms of columns and summarizing information. And I thought, let's look at, and Judy wanted to look at this, the, 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 the data that wasn't really analyzed very well, or it was filled, the niche that hadn't yet been filled was the world of off-Broadway. But there were two ways this project began to address data lacks. Um, everybody was looking at Broadway. It was easier to look at Broadway. It's a smaller number. Um, the data were available in a range of different ways online and as you can see, you know, who was being produced, who was directed. And what Judy and I built is this database that we continue to build. Um, it's, it's now 12 or 14 years deep, um, the tracking for the larger off-Broadway uh, producing companies, their full seasons, uh, and looking at playwrights, and Portia does this too, you know, playwrights, directors, designers, even dramaturgs, stage managers, kind of across it's 13 categories of employment categories we look at and looking at gender. And the one last thing I'll, I'll look and stop talking about this because it's just, it's just describing the project. Um, with the most recent project as we're kind of emerging slowly from, from the pandemic, um, it's something that's been bothering me for, for both of us for a while, dealing with the non-binary. Mm. And so we've kind of gone back and continue to track and put a lot of effort into searching for pronouns and identifying. So we have a non-binary category too, which maybe in some great future world, we're not gonna think about categorizing, but that gets to our various question here. There are foundational question yeah. here. I, I very much wanted right? non-binary represented tonight, but I, mm -hmm. it, was, it didn't happen. And I'm planning on the next time we do one of these, making sure that it's Includes, includes that's great. Non -binary. That's great. I'm very aware of it. And I was well, and we explain our little way. You know, it's just that the people that there's two things going on, and I guess it is part of the conversation. I guess mm -hmm. you know, it's not yes. just a binary anymore. In a way, um, it's it's fascinating to engage with it. It's a challenge to data data uh, collectors, uh, but it's 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 an imperative for us as a society to. to embrace it and figure it out. <laughs> well, and the, the other thing that's really important about that is that non-binary is probably the least accepted sexuality on, on our planet and in our culture, and it's the least understood. Mm -hmm. And I think that whatever issues are going on in terms of gender parity, the non-binary issues are probably 
incrementally or maybe even exponentially increase because it seems like the, the, the group in our, in our culture that is most open to attack uh, right now. Um, and I, I, I know that we're hopefully in a world that's changing and shifting, but I have a, a great amount of um, deep compassion for what non-binary people go through. Um, and I'm still not good at using the right pronouns, but I still have the compassion. They're all, what, what we're learning, Judy and I are learning, and everybody who's paying attention to this or kind of categorizing, they're all manner of pronouns. You know, anything that's other than, the way we're kept definitely defining it very simply, but tracking what pronouns people mm -hmm. um, desire, anything other than he, him, she, her is fitting into our category, but we're tracking the, the pronouns that people are using, and maybe that we'll analyze that in some way, maybe not. <laughs> but at least we know we're, we're retaining it. I have a question for you. Would you would you like to meet the, the people that are with us on Zoom and in the room and find out what their concerns are, like in maybe like a minute uh, for each, or, or, or do you want to just jump in? I'm open. Yeah. What do you think? What, do you what think would sure? you like, Ms. Ms. Moderator? Yes. Well, should we say if anybody wants to talk about themselves, yes. maybe we don't make it mandatory? That's right. I that's think that makes the most sense. So, uh, so whoever, let's start in the live room for the time being. Would anybody care to introduce themselves, uh, posit their experience in terms of working for gender parity? Tell us what, what do you want to talk about this evening? Volunteers. Um, yes. My name is Rosemary Brandwine. I am currently the president of Polaris North, and I am a playwright. And uh, I've been, I have uh, experienced gender inequality for many, many years, and now I'm experiencing the newest inequality, ageism. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in, in how the two of them now are, are working to sort of still counteract our progress. So those are the types of questions that you know I'm interested in as well. That's useful. That's good. That's good. Thank Cheryl you. Ann, did you want to just give well, us Well, I don't have any questions. My name is Cheryl Ann Adlin. I'm a, a singer. I'm writing a book now. I do a lot of different things. I don't really have any questions. I'm here to learn. Okay. I listen to what everyone says. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, any? Oh, Owen, do you want to see if, if anybody online wants to, uh, in Zoom, wants to want to raise their hand? Yeah, if, if anyone would like to speak uh, either virtually or, you know, just raise your hand or, I mean, you could probably just unmute yourself right now. Judith, you want to start? Sure. Um, my, my overall question that I'd like to hear from the panel is my concern has been all along with all these um, studies and reports and, and, um, how how people are are focusing now on different forms of parody and so forth if it's like a flash in the pan or if it's going to you know sort of continue going forward and getting so that we get to the point where we don't have to talk about it anymore and it's just you get hired because of your work That's a tough one. Yeah. Yes. Um, a flash in the pan. It's one of the very longest flashes mm -hmm. in the pan in history. It's yeah. been going on for a millennium. And even more recently, there are those of us who remember the 50-50 in 2020 yeah. campaign. We've now passed that. Yeah. Passed that, and it's still be looking. And like the other thing that I, I've opened up before with before the 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 idea that that the Supreme Court has just evicted Roe versus Wade from from our sense of culture, society, and morality is just astonishing to me. Um, and does something like that put different or additional pressures on, on women in the creative arts? Because you look at things like Handmaid's Tale uh, and the fact that somebody created a work of art that then people started dressing like that in real life to make, to protest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like the work of artists is also, we can, we advocate in different ways perhaps than just standard legislative advocacy. I also think that while we were working through the, the gender parity, you know, amongst women and women identifying, that in the midst of the pandemic, um, the death of Mr. Floyd and others mm -hmm. really opened up, now let me say the way I always say it, tore down the curtains of what was going on 
in the world of theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we all knew what was going on. As women, we can speak about that, but then there was, if you're intersectional, yeah. like a multicultural, <laughs> multicultural yes. we're like, well, we, we've known for decades that mm -hmm. this has been going on. I mean, you can see it. And, you know, two things that came out of that was, um, and I have to keep looking at it because we I don't want to say white theater. We yeah. see you white theater, uh -huh. and theater's not we speaking see you white out. American. Right. White American yeah. theaters, theaters. Thank you. with, with the credo and their tenets, mm -hmm. and then there is the theaters not speaking out, which was a, a, a list of theaters across the country that were pointed out for either posting something on their website or social media regarding standing by, you know, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. and. Now we're seeing what the numbers are. So now we were looking at the numbers for women, right, Martha? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you, you did that study. And now we're seeing what the numbers are as far as demographics, right? Mm -hmm. And how right. people identify. So that question is a great question and complicated question, um, Judy, because I don't know if it's, I think it's a very big frying pan. And I, as, as Bob said, but I think now we have just peel back the, the layers of the mm -hmm. onion to now expose what else is going on. Right, yeah. Right. I want to address something on that, mm -hmm. jump on that for a second. Um, we're actually doing a new study um, with the league mm -hmm. and um, I sort of got roped into it. It was interesting. Uh, as the development chair, mm -hmm. I was working with our development committee to actually get the money um, from the REDC. We got an REDC grant from NISCA. Mm -hmm. And uh, that money gave us uh, support to actually present this grant, to create this study, excuse me. And so um, within the study, we are not just looking, it's a pay equity study. So we're not just looking at how much money people are making, but who are you and how much money are you making? <laughs> right. so, so that's a lot of it now. We're asking age, we're asking. Uh, so people are voluntarily um, yes. like agreeing to it. Yes, it's anonymous. It's anonymous. It's anonymous. We're hoping and there are some people, people skip, but we're hoping to get as many people as we can to respond and say, you know, I'm indigenous. This is how much money I make. So it, it it's addressing yeah the the salary yeah. question is it the salary it's disparity. an important question is one that's hard to get at. It's very hard and we're finding that now. Yeah. It's complicated. A lot of people are skipping, and so and then people are also not necessarily identifying their gender. So we did say, if you were comfortable identifying, we didn't give a list. We basically just left mm -hmm. it open and said, right. tell us how you see yourself. How do you want us to know It could be a first run at this study is what it sounds like. It could be what? You might, a first run at it. So it is. It is. What Thank works you, Martha. Does it work. What researchers do, it happens all the time. It's exactly right. And yeah. actually, in the discussion we've been having with our research group and um, other members of this committee trying to put this whole thing together, we have found that we keep dropping down to more questions. And mm -hmm. so we realize we can't have all those questions in this study, but it has opened the door to additional studies to start to examine. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's great. very I exciting. I want to add, so this, this research project is an ongoing one, the Women Count Research yes. Project, which maybe at some point you can, you can uh, provide to your people and follow up in, um, Communications, the actual link to it, so they'll get the yes. link. Okay, we'll it's where all the reports are. Yeah, just let, just let me know, and I'll, I'll send it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just so, so we don't, I don't have to read out a, a website URL. It's more boring than that. But I want to give some hope. I mean, it doesn't have to be just the data. We don't have to stay on data stuff. But I was reminding myself of this. So the most recent report we put out was in May of this year, which was an interesting year because it was both the I wanted to put up because it was just two years of data, but we were both I introducing the uh, the, the non-binary category, which didn't make a huge difference. It was more in our database. Okay, we're, we're, we can now capture non-binary people in a systematic way. Um, uh, but also was also looking at the truncated um, pandemic year, 1920. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't quite a full year. 2020. 2020. 2020. Yeah. 1920 yeah. to 20, 2019 to 2020. Yeah. That season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, of course, we skipped. You know, we had a whole season we didn't experience at all. And then uh, 20, 21, 22, uh, which um, was just kind of like less than half of what, um, the, the, in terms of productions that were yeah. that were happening, you're seeing we're just kind of starting the engine again. 
um, and having our numbers, so it was, this maybe we're used to seeing in our database, 120 or so productions in the year among the, the theaters that we're tracking, yeah. and there were maybe 50 that happened yeah. in, the, in that yeah. this most recent completed season. But among those 50, the percentage of women and I went up in several categories for the first time. So it was this was a, this was a time to make a chance, you know, take a chance, whatever it was. So you yeah. conventionally in our database, going above parity, 50 above 50 percent. Um, the stage managers, which is true yes. across the country, is like 70, 70, 70% 70 of uh, across the country, stage manager, production stage managers and of stage managers, assistant stage managers, like 70% women. Um, um, and costume designers, of course. And that proved true, again, for the truncated pandemic year. But in this re, re, uh, restarting 2021-22 uh, last season, um, for the first time, in our database, well, not the first time, but um, playwrights, directors, um, lighting designers, and costume designers. Costume designers. Well, that costume designers yeah, often. Yeah. Always. We're all we're all above parity in some. Or lighting costumes. designers. Yeah. Yeah. Sound so, is still men. Sound is still men. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, but but lighting, growing. Yeah. Like growing, percentages. Yeah. The percentage of women is, is higher. So, but we should yeah. check in with Portia about this. This is her. This is her area. Uh, Portia, did you want to uh, add anything to this? You're noticing those same trends, or uh, not above fifty, certainly in Lordland. Um, the numbers over the eight years I've studied, most regions, most categories have at least doubled in terms of representation. I I don't look at non-binary the same way. Like I've divided it into like. These folks use she, they, yeah. these folks use they, he, these folks use they, um, this person uses all, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little, the pieces are a little teenier in the pies, mm -hmm. right? Like if you put all those pieces together, it might be like 0.5, but as it is, they're all like 0.1. Gotcha. Right? What is um, the solution? Portia, Portia, just out of curiosity, what, what is your own experience as a, as a lighting designer? Uh, my own experience. Help, help, help me, help me be more specific so I can be succinct. Has it been, has it been harder, hard for you? Have you seen things get any easier? Uh, are you, are you up against uh, a patriarchy in theater? That things are easier because I made hard decisions, right? Like they're easier because now I, I tell folks up front, like. I will not be the only woman. I will not be the only woman of color on a design team, yeah. right? Um, plus the director, right? We can put the director in that, but otherwise, I don't take the show. Good. Right. So yeah. I've chosen to curate my career in that way. That I'm done being the only in a room, because um, often when I have been the only, I've been called on to be like the cultural competency consultant, okay. <laughs> which no one's paying me to do as the lighting designer. Right. Not saying not capable, but like, that's not what you're paying me for. And well, I'm this, certain they don't ask the white men who they hire as line designers to be cultural competency consultants for free either. So uh, <laughs> yes, it's easier because I, I have chosen in my life and I have the privilege to do it now of saying no. Um, I say no a lot. I say no a lot more often than I say yes, which sometimes makes me sad right because i've trained to be a lighting designer i've been one for 20 plus years it would be nice to go cra practice my craft and my art more often but i've learned many environments aren't uh ready to support someone like me in that role but the choices you're making are helping to make things change so so i think it's very admirable i mean I, I, you know who knows if they get the email from me and are like whatever or if they're like oh that actually means something right like we can't really know that um, I have noticed several times where I've said no to a show that like, look, there's a white person who just came in to light the show. Oh. Right. That like I've noticed, right? Like, oh, you asked me and then you went to your standard list who has designed there many times because I have your list from the study. But I do think more power to you, Portia. And that's one thing that actually the League of Professional Theater Women some years back, with an, another conversation. Uh, the idea yes. is that uh, one of the efforts that we all can make to help pro promote gender parity is to try to pro promote situations where if there is a position open, 
to like make sure that there's at least one or several women, people of color, et cetera, make sure they're part of the pool of consideration. And when people are in the hiring situation, to urge them to have one more conversation is like, if you think that they may go to like the white person, the white guy, Portia, and then people urge them, it's like, don't stop at just the white guy, don't stop at just the usual suspects, have another conversation, meet somebody else. And we can all do that also. They say, like, for example, like sometimes I'll have writing opportunities that either I can't or don't choose to take. And I always try to choose to recommend a woman of color for that job. Like, I can't do it, but here's like three women playwrights I know who might be able to help you in this. And I feel like that's something that if we don't already do that, if we can do relatively easily, like cast, cast your bread upon the water. You know, I, I also continue having that conversation. My husband, um, you know, he's you know, white. And... And he's also in the industry. He's a you know, professor. And so we have these conversations where I said, you are in a perfect position as an educator to open the doors for your, you know, your young you know, women uh, students, women identifying students who want to do tech, right? Who want to be lighting designers, who want to build a set. I mean, this is it. And that's also another way to have that one more conversation, right? Because if there's people in a place of privilege, they should use that yes. that platform ally. to be able Yeah. Ally. ally and then some, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's um it's just something that I know that I consistently do with my crew that is mixed. It's like, listen, it's not just us, you know, people of color trying to like do this. You gotta do it too. Like, it works. We all have to do it. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And Martha, I wanted to go back to uh, what you're discovering in terms of it seems like there the the pandemic transition. I've also noticed like our prominent artistic directors, like board artistic directors, it seems like there's a shift, in, a generational shift happening. It looks like really we're is. taking the opportunity to not just go obviously younger, but to women, color, etc. Yeah. Are you noticing that? that? You're noticing that people are being. Yeah, do it. Co-directing, mm -hmm. you know, artistic directing pairs, yes. And trios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes to all of that. Yeah. It'll be it'll be fascinating to track the effects and see how that works so out. It, yeah. Hopefully, it's not going to all like Nataki Karen <laughs> and that terrible situation. I'm an organ. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah that was not one. Uh, for those want? of for those yeah. of you who are not aware, um, Nataki Garrett is an African American artistic director of of the. Uh, uh, OSF, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Festival. Right. And she, in Ashland. Ashland. And she has been getting death threats and threats to her family, et cetera, because of the direction she's chosen to add more color, so to speak, to the Shakespeare. They brought um, her in. Right. They brought she's, her in. She's, yes. yes. She's a replacement. Yeah. yeah. And she's part of that new generation of prominent right. artistic directors, mm -hmm. but she's suffering uh, some backlash Insane. as a result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to have this conversation without being intersectional, isn't it? Yeah, it is it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also interesting that women are not considered minorities by many people. And so that's, we're not a minority in terms of how many of us exist. We're a minority in terms of us getting the jobs. And so that's a, still a continuous, you know, climb. And uh, it's, it's so much better. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to watch that. But people should never recognize that this is not still a fight. Which well, is another well, reason said that you... for the ongoing data projects. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a one-off. Right. Oh, our right. project or at Porsches or any of them, and they can't be. You know, we have to. Yeah. Well, it might they might change shape the, the projects themselves, but we have to continue monitoring uh, the the state of, of who's being hired and yeah. where they're going and how they're surviving in the jobs. Well, Lorca, you you said earlier that your your response to early career discrimination was to start your own company. Well, I'm Puerto Rican. I may, I may not look Puerto Rican, but I'm half Puerto Rican. Yeah. I'm also a quarter Sephardic. So I my, that too. my grandfather was from Iraq. <laughs> so my last name is Beres, so my first name is Lorca. So it's very confusing to be a, a Puerto Rican, <laughs> uh, Jewish, Arabic, uh, and a quarter Polish person. Um, that I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> my, my grandmother was from Wuj. Oh, okay. yes. And the family was killed, the majority of family was killed yeah. during the Holocaust, and, and the Iraqis had to escape genocide, and they all came here to the United States, lots of diaspora, 
and uh, Puerto Rico, you know. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I was just telling the lady yes. when we were outside as, a, as an actor, I was an actor first, and, you know, I can't tell you how many prostitutes I played, mm -hmm. including my first professional gig at Missouri Repertory. I was 19 years old. I was cast in a very cute little, sh I had a tiny role. Oh, Evel it was, oh, Eloise, let's go in the garden and play. It was a play by Abelard and Eloise. Yeah. And we're sitting around the table, and Hal Scott, Harold Scott, was the director, brought in from New York, marvelous director. And uh, we go through the play. We finish the read through, and he goes, what's your name, dear? And I said, Lorca Paris. And he asked another girl, what's your name, dear? We're both 19. And she says, he says, would you switch roles, please? And she got, oh, Eloise can you know, go in the garden and play. And I got the whore, like this huge seven-minute scene, Yvonne, the woman, you know, with Barry Boys, the lead in the production. It was an equity role. I mean, it was, like, huge. That was the beginning of many prostitutes. I actually wanted to. It's good to be working, but yeah. you know, yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. But I let's uh, to get to touch away from numbers, mm -hmm. but in terms because there are different issues that arise when women are involved. For example, there's like Me Too, mm -hmm. and there are a number of theater companies where women have complained about the way they were treated by the male artistic directors, directors, etc. And the harassment. Tons, exactly. Tons and the rise of intimacy coordinators yes. Yes. as a whole it's new job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. um, just... Sorry, if I could just jump in. Janelle has had her hand raised for a while, so I just want to acknowledge oh, that. Janelle, Janelle, I can't see it. Janelle. It's, oh, it's under the recording. Janelle, you're muted. Yes, I was saying I was enjoying the conversation um, and you were answering a lot of the questions that I had. So I was sort of in an amen corner, sort of, but definitely the the intersectionality. And as a daughter of uh, Caribbean parentage, Trinidad and Venezuela, ooh, ooh, um, I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I am a producer, a Broadway investor, and a dramaturg. And I'm really interested in this reoccurring sort of statistic that I keep seeing and how and how do we circle that back? So the statistic is who is the ticket buyer? Who is the audience ticket buyer? And usually it is a woman in what is it, 40s to, I don't know the exact, so so you can correct yeah. me on that. But I'm trying to understand if the audience and the ticket buyer is a woman of that age, why isn't there parity in the stories that we're seeing that female playwrights aren't being produced exponentially more if that is the ticket buyer? And how do we get to a place where that can sort of, because if green is the thing, right, shouldn't that sort of, some way equate in the equation. So I just wanted to offer that up for a discussion. The lead producers are still primarily men. Mm -hmm. They think that it's similar to books for children where they say that uh, little girls will read books that are written for little boys, to put it that way. But little boys are kind of shun, pushed away from books that are quote unquote for little girls. So I think it's more accepted that women will, because the male story is again, quote unquote, universal. Mm -hmm. So it's more it's more accepted that a male story will appeal to everyone, whereas a women's story is more more genre, more like potentially yeah. risky. That's my perspective. I also just feel like, just in my own experience, mm -hmm. that the world of and Jane Dubin can probably speak to this. Um, mm -hmm. The world of Broadway mm -hmm. is just its own planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With its own machine, mm -hmm. with its own confusing formula of how to produce, um, and the marketing, and all of this. We had many have. case studies to still try to figure out mm -hmm. amazing shows with new, extraordinary stories and new voices that have hit Broadway over the last two seasons, and we have early, early cancellation or yeah. early, you know, short, truncated runs yeah. and. To understand why that was. K-pop. Yeah. Oh, it's not horrible. Oh, I'm so sad. Oh, so sad. Yes. 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 That's a, it's a show that a Korean show it ran for two months or one month. Oh. Oh, so and now the, the, uh, the newest one. Yeah. Yes. The one, the, the movie. One of the 
Oh, oh, uh, famous. Famous. Yeah, famous. Famous. Yeah. 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 That's a different kind of story. Completely though. different, but it's close. Yeah. 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 After under 100. I have a tech question for a second. Sandy, what am I going to have as a thing to put on, a video to put on, on YouTube? Um, are we going to be visible or is it going to be? It'll be visible either on the screen or in the window. Okay. I'm just concerned about you two. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Yeah, also, to swing back to uh, non-binary, mm -hmm. uh, Bob was bringing up and the lack of non-binary representation on this panel, unfortunately. But also, it's interesting to me that non-binary representation it seems to be happening more in terms of like on stage, but then it becomes like, but then you don't have non-binary people telling their own stories. And I think that's another issue. I 100% agree with you because I was looking for um, a person to fill the spot mm -hmm. and I had to reach out to somebody else and then I was unclear um, of, of the language. Mm -hmm. and, and then it all, cut, Bob, then you made it all work. We all made it work out, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, you're under, un, it was it was unclear whether or not what what some of the preferred pronouns were, or the language to use to make the act, or what was the language? The possible shift, and from when I knew the person to today, because yeah. this is the the last time we worked together. Oh, the transition. Oh, the person okay. had transitioned. Or Possibly. Okay. You have to so check. I, I just, I just didn't check. know, and I, right. you know, I don't want to right. ever. Don't assume. I don't want to make an assumption, so okay. I just but asking the question. It is. But it, but, right. but becoming comfortable with asking the question. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I become. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> so so it was interesting because last year it was expected of us to ask the classes mm -hmm. what their preferred pronoun was mm -hmm. and introduce right. ourselves with our preferred pronoun. Mm -hmm. And just this past September, they said, let's not do that anymore because some kids felt outed. It made oh, them feel uncomfortable. That's interesting. Yeah, isn't that? It's, so yeah. it was something brand new. And it's like so what, it was, their comfort level. Yeah. Right, right. See, it's ever evolving, right? Yeah. Yes. Because you just. And I encountered, and I mean, it's great. I just, the researcher hat on, it's, there's so many dimensions to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and Judy and I will have a conversation about it because I made a change in our database today with one particular person, I won't even mention it now because it doesn't matter, but this particular person whose name, who as a, as a, a creative had been present, it has been present in our database for prominently, quite actively, you know, eight or 10 entries. And I just saw and they changed. Uh, they them. Yeah, they changed. Mm -hmm. right. Prior, and it had not been at all clear before. I think this person had not had didn't use any pronoun. I noticed mm -hmm. in looking back yeah. across them, but I made we made an assumption. Mm -hmm. I made an assumption female. Um, um, but I saw for the first time very clearly in a Soho rep show that's coming up, uh, they them and that oh, well, okay, that's pretty clear. Yeah. And we made the decision and that I retroactively make notes, but I retroactively attributed. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to capture what they were at any one particular time where mm -hmm. You know, but now that I feel safe to identify a particular Yeah, but way. it may go back several years. Like it's, that person in our database will be the status that we know as a, but anyway, that's, that's a data oriented decision. But um, it's, I know. It's an interesting thing because yeah. with the data and, and Lark and I were talking about this project I'm working on as far as uh, with three other actresses um, on our genealogy and our DNA and talking about like, think, oh, where's my uh, Janelle will identify maybe might identify with this being Indo-Caribbean or being mm -hmm. from Trinidad, you know, it, we're, we're uh, what we call Kalalu. We, we all yes. don't look the same when we don't, you know, we're, um, we're not all Indian. We're not all African descent. We're not all Spanish, yeah. you know, it's, and then your DNA, my DNA ch like changed twice. <laughs> I was like, Latina, and then all of a sudden it wasn't Latina anymore. I'm like, oh, oh okay. okay. Differently by the tester? Yeah, well, I did, result? Did yeah, it just oh, unfolded. Wow. Like, so just um, this wow. past Easter, I'm Latina again, which is fine. But it's, I'm just thinking just as far as mm -hmm. ethnicity and, yeah. and identifying, it's like, where, you know, where do you fit in? And then let's go to the data. How do you right. parse that? Yeah, right. right. Especially, holes that we're supposed to fit into. Because yes. if I take anyone, if I, 
fill out a form that's trying to did a data collection form, my box is not going to be there. No. So I'm not accounted for. Other. Yeah. <laughs> Other. Yeah. Other. Now, yeah. can we ask Jane that question that Janelle had posed? Oh, yeah. Jane, yeah. are you with us? Jane, Jane, Jane is a, uh, hello, hello. Hi, Jane. Hola. <laughs> Hola. What, what was the, the question about why uh, stories of, of under underrepresented or women's stories are not being well, successful on Broadway? Um, no, I, well, the question really was, can we use that sort of data of women being the, the, the the demographic of the ticket buyer and somehow to get closer to the parity of seeing all the other parts where they're not reflected um, being a little more even. Is there some way that we can get closer to that balance? Um, one would hope, but I, I don't think it's a secret that women are the ticket buyers because that's what everybody, like every marketing firm will tell you that and all the marketing efforts for Broadway are directed. Mm -hmm towards you know, the, the women of a certain age with the idea that they're gonna buy the tickets, but when they're women of a certain age who are married to men, often they buy tickets if they want their husbands to come with them, um, that they want to make sure that their husbands are okay with it. I, you know, this is a, the quandary, we, we, we've been seeing it ever since the, well, we've been seeing it forever, but since the return from, from the pandemic, we've had a lot of shows that are have been written by with stories of typically underrepresented stories that are being told mm -hmm. and and sadly many of them are crashing and burning right. and i i guess i would say this is a little like you know when when moses took the the promised the people to the promised land and they drowned everybody and they went to the other side and started all over I think one of the problems it goes back to school. Like kids in school are not being trained to be theater goers, right? Like the studies that the Broadway League did will say that the most, uh, the, the people who, who go most often to theater went as children. You know, it just sort of becomes part of their thing. And Number one, it's expensive. Number two, arts education, as we know, is the first thing to go in all of our schools and it's not, uh, you know, it's just not there in, in so many schools. And so people are not growing up with the idea of theater as their first place to go. And I don't think it's really a question of money because people are spending, you know, hundreds of dollars to go to concerts, mm -hmm. right? But they're not spending or to go to a ball game. You know, Yankee Yankee Stadium is sold out, um, and even in the bleachers, you. It's, but they're not going to Broadway, and people people do want to see themselves on stage. That's sort of also an established thing, but they're not focused on that as an option. There's so many other options, and we have to train people. I mean, it's really that simple. We have to go we have to go to people and not expect people to come to us, mm -hmm. right? Point. We can't only go to people, oh, I have a show with a black cast, come see it. And it's like, well, who are you that you're suddenly telling me about this? Where have you been right. like all this time? You have to really integrate into, into the communities and teach people that it's okay to come to Broadway, teach people that, there's, that there are stories being told that represent them because they're not necessarily being advertised to, they're not necessarily being interacted with. Um, I don't. I don't. Other than that, I don't know the answer. I mean, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks, I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty. You know, it's pretty sad. Um, and I think I. I hope that there isn't a a, a backlash in sense or what did you call it a blacklash. Yes. Um, yes. With, mm -hmm. with at, at OSF, mm -hmm. um, where there have been so many plays written by by black playwrights that, and they haven't done well, to say, uh, "See, we tried," you know. Um, it was the, it was a season. I mean, it was, it was a, a pandemic. Well, and, I mean, it right, but it's continuing this season as well. Um, but the fact of the matter is that most like most shows do fail commercially, 
they may be critical and audience successes, but financially it's not a really great business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to attribute failing to the stories being told is, is really disingenuous. Broadway itself is not, you know, other than a few really popping names, the, the Broadway's not doing as well as it's, it did before the pandemic. And all, a lot of shows are struggling, which is why, you know, so many are closing, even popular long time running hits are closing or have closed. So I, I don't know the answer, Janelle or panel. I just, I think it's a, I think it's problematic and we have to do more work, you know, earlier and earlier in, in people's lives to get them, to get them to see that, to, to have theater be a habit. You know, on a, on, a, on a sort of separate note, I would say, we also do a horrible job of, of promoting off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. And while Broadway is the glitz, off-Broadway and off-Broadway is where risk is being taken and where Absolutely. plays are being developed and new, you know, rising stars are being seen. And we call it off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway. <laughs> That's really, you know, appetizing. Let's go off, Broadway. Read, read you know, it's Broadway it's light. It's like, it's, um, and I, I personally think that there's like tremendous opportunities for, for audiences to see really great shows in smaller, more intimate theaters. And that's where the shows that people like, you know, if we go, if we train people that they can have great experiences at less lesser price, you know, then they can, Maybe go to Broadway if they want, but Broadway is not the be-all and end-all. Um, you know, somewhat, somewhat off-topic, but the but the truth of the matter has always been that Broadway has depended on 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 names. Basically, the, the audience that that's going to keep a show running for a year or two have to be familiar with something about the show. Um, it, it's the brands, yeah, the music like man. Right. The music man is having no problems during during the pandemic uh, at all. Um, Phantom of the Opera was running forever, it's finally starting to drop off. I think that's just <laughs> fatigue. It's just like battle fatigue at this point. Um, I, think that, I think that somebody could do an interesting study and just sit down and, and examine what shows did well during the pandemic. I suspect a lot of it had to do with brand names and white recognizable names, things that people would be willing to risk going to a theater without a mask to see. So, uh, but, and that affects parody. Mm -hmm. So let's let's tie it in. It, it, it affects parody in that. Well, if you want to produce a show that's going to recoup and you want it to be familiar to the theater going audience around the country and around the world because you need show, Hugh, Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman or your, you know, um, Bette Midler's, you know, those big names, Sutton okay. Foster's. I mean, although well, don't have a contract like they had with Bette Midler, where all the profits go to her. Don't uh, do that. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh -huh. But you know, in the same breath, 1776 is an all female. Oh, no, right wow. yeah. good for that. So yeah. I mean, we know who's taking people. the risk? Elizabeth yeah. is in it. Elizabeth Davis. Yeah. Into the Crystal. Crystal. Yeah, yeah, I worked with her in 2019. Yeah. Into the Woods. Yeah, into the Woods. Yeah. 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 I mean, so there are, there are, there are six, which I love that show so much. Oh, yeah. But got a non-binary. Non that's, that's right. right. That's right. So, but the majority of the season, mm -hmm. or the majority of the shows that are mm -hmm. running right now, mm -hmm. um, don't necessarily reflect that. It's not across the board, is what I'm yeah. saying. Especially if you're looking to recoup. I think odds are that if it's a project on Broadway, you're not. You're less likely probably going to, to risk hiring a woman, risk you having a woman playwright. I remember that. I remember back when uh, Lynn Nottage wrote Ruined, and it was like they re-upped it at MTC umpty billion times and didn't move it to Broadway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas as other plays that, like, other plays that with uh, white male playwrights, they would just say like, "Oh, let's take it to Broadway." People are yeah. not willing. People view women as risk. They didn't yeah. think they would buy the tickets. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. There was actually a show on during the pandemic that was on, and I, I was sitting in the audience. And I was just like, really? <laughs> I was like, this is the one we're bringing back? The one that will be named. The not one not that will, named. Not named. <laughs> and I was so happy because I 
because I knew the, I knew the stage manager was, you know, and I, I was thrilled that, you know, she got work, but I really was sitting in there like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right. That's well, I think, I think, that's awesome I think Jane made an important point. It's basically that we don't educate our, our children to yeah. love theater. Uh, we don't educate our children to love art. Yeah. Um, and we'd have, we have really, uh, the first, uh, Jane, Jane said it, the first thing that gets cut from any school program is the arts. Right. right. Instruments. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So. Sorry, can I, I add think, something? Yeah. So I think it's also, though, we have to look at how theaters treat people when they go in. Right. There's a number of those big name theaters in New York that I won't go to because I've had bad experience at them. Right. I was told by an usher at a comedy that my laugh was distracting the people in front of me. <laughs> right. And I was like, it's a comedy. Yeah. Um, right. But evidently it wasn't that kind of comedy. I wasn't supposed to laugh at it. Right. I was supposed to laugh inside. <laughs> and so we treat theater goers, I feel like often like um, children to be scolded. Right. Like, ooh, look at you, you whispered. So we're all going to scold you now, right? And, you know, even last year, I was a Tony voter last year, right? So I had to go to all these Broadway shows, which thankfully I don't have to do again. Um, I did not enjoy it, right? I had always thought, oh, I don't like Broadway because I haven't been exposed enough to Broadway because I can't afford to go to Broadway. No, 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 it's just I don't generally like Broadway, right? After 35 shows in one season, I liked five, in case anyone's wondering. But even that, I would go to the ticket windows and be like, hi, I'm, I'm this person. It will be under the Tony voter tickets. And at least half the box offices would look at me and be like, you? Oh my and God. I'm like, yes, I, yes. I, I, I realize I'm here in a giant coat because it's winter. I have a backpack because I come in on the train, right? I look like a student who's just like here for rush tickets or whatever. But yes, I am. So can you please let me go sit in my seat now? But if that's how they treat people, right? Like if that's how your front of office staff, your admin folks, people treat the audience, why would they come back? Right? I feel no need to go back to any of those theaters at this point, even if they do have a show I'd want to see. Because why, why would I pay money to be treated badly, right? Versus I could go to a concert and I'll just be treated anonymously, right? I could pay the same amount of money to go see, I don't know, Lizzo in Hartford in May, which I'm going to do in case anyone's wondering. Okay. Uh, with my kid, we're so excited. We keep singing all the songs. And they're gonna treat us lovely, right? We're gonna be treated like royalty, even though we're all the way up in the back, right? As far as you can get seats versus in a theater, you're just treated like another number. So why would you go? I think Dominique Morisseau had written a piece about the way she was treated. She had, mm -hmm. Yes, but didn't she also, wasn't she the person responsible for inserts and into the play playbills of the plays one season saying, do whatever you want yes. to do. Laugh, yeah. scream, stand up, stand up, up scream, yeah. yeah. Yep. To Enjoy. make people feel comfortable. Yeah. And that happened to me at Lincoln Center. What was it? Oslo and Pipeline was playing uh, in two yeah. different theaters. Yeah. And there is a, a woman who worked for Lincoln Center, like I was next to Lorca. Okay. And she would go to like, look, okay, you're going to Oslo. I'm going to be, okay, you're going to Pipeline. Like, actually, I'm, I'm going to Oslo today. But she just looked at people and said, figured out this is what you're going to see. Wow. Yeah. Profiling. Exactly. <laughs> you are profiled by our I mean, it, happen yeah. it happens yeah. constantly. People yeah. jump to assumptions about who you, uh, who you are, what your tastes are, what you're here to see, and yeah. how you're going to behave while you're there. I want to respond to something that Susan Isaac posted. Uh, we often do not treat children, theater for children with the same artistic respect to work, mm -hmm. working with young audiences, but then where do we develop these audiences? But what I was talking about was the fact that, that this, it's not started in the schools. There are, there, are, uh, there are children's theater companies around the country, and I become more and more aware of them, that do treat children's theater with great respect and great passion and great love. We had a couple of people on a panel month or so ago. Um, the theaters are not the, not the problem. The theaters are developing those audiences. Uh, the, the ones that are being successful at it, I, I hope they all are. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the culture. It's our culture that I'm concerned about. It's a culture that really just looks quizzically at art and says, why are you here? Uh, and I, I, I think that's what we have to, we have to really uh -huh. cope with. 
And people are dismissive of art and artists and say that they figure that, oh, well, it's something that you do because it's fun for you. It's not like a serious thing. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not your blood and guts. <laughs> yeah. It's not like real. <laughs> Most, I, mean, uh, I have a question. Where do we stack up American gender charity initiatives versus other theater organizations internationally, namely London Theater? I think we're better. I have a feeling that we're we're doing better, but um, maybe a little bit more conscious. Yeah, but I think that's consciousness. I think is an important, you know, word here. Mm -hmm. We've been talking a lot about educating people mm -hmm. and kind of finding ways to be more aware. And I think the whole the starting with the whole George Floyd movement mm -hmm. and the sensitivity. And everybody starting to look and listen and recognize, you know, some people for the first time. I think that's such a, a big part of what we need to continue doing. Yeah. Is you know, just see where where people are making mistakes. How do we fix it? What can we do about it? So you know, we can all complain, but we really have to figure out how to reach people to address it and and continue to make change. One thing I do think is hopeful is that I do see the younger generations. I, he said it, whatever age I am, but the, the younger generations are really um, sensitive to to sexuality and, and, and gender and, and all that. Uh, to them, I, I, it's it's hopeful if they somehow are growing into our culture and bringing that awareness with them. Um, I, I can't swear that that's what's going to happen because they could be worn down by people in positions of power who are older than them who convince them that what they're feeling isn't real. But hopefully they will bring that in and we will start changing a little bit more. Um, the changes in our country have been so incremental, so small. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to be able to have hope that the new, that younger generation, except I'm, I'm generalizing, I'm saying that all younger generation people have these feelings and that's not true. Yeah. There's a whole swathe yeah. of, of the country that has no understanding don't of patients. Don't say gay. They don't yeah. say gay. Yeah, we've got all these. Sure, rules. I'm going to move to Florida tomorrow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Judy has a question. Do you think it's gotten worse since STEM has been emphasized in the schools? Uh, now well, she, she did STEAM with the A. Yeah, and then Susan yeah. has said, yeah. talked about STEAM. Thank you. Interesting, thank goodness. That's what the kids don't around. Gotten Nothing. worse? Why would you think it's gotten worse? I think it's the contrary, no? Are you saying, Judy, that it's a lot, uh, that... You're talking about, uh, you, you all were talking about um, arts are out of the schools, out of, out of people's lives, and that it should oh. be in schools, and I'm saying, I'm asking about STEM being the big focus. Yeah, yeah right, that they're, push, they're pushing for that, for girls, as right. opposed to the arts. Well, just STEM for everybody. It's all about, you know, money and, and STEM. So, uh, but, but Susan has now said there's yeah, science, science, technology, 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 engineering, and math. Yeah, engineering and math. And then A through the arts and being the arts. It's, it's a big deal for um, young women. I do know that. Um, that are what they don't tell you involved. is that nearly 30% of young women leave STEM because of sexism, because right. of lack of promotions and lack of opportunity. They don't tell people that. No, That's what's go. happening. Yeah. And even at the educational level, let's say my understanding is when I went to school with uh, girls who are studying engineering, that they had to go, if they had questions, and the teacher said, well, are you sure you're studying the right subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. As opposed to helping them the way they would. We are. Uh, um, our theater company actually went into a, a, a university that was focused on technology, and we worked with engineering students, mm -hmm. and we allowed them to create their, you know, their vignettes. We didn't want to tell their stories, mm -hmm. and that was always one of the skits that they would do, which was being a young woman, um, BIPOC specifically, um, Middle Eastern, and the just. Oh my goodness, what they had to go through as far as expectation of straight A's and then being talked down to because you're a woman and all of this. 
this was all in this I had no idea. I mean, I'm not in the world of engineering, but I had no idea that it was that prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's in any world where you're you are in the minority. I mean, certainly in the world of law, I got taken for a secretary, paralegal. court reporter, paralegal, eighty bazillion times because people don't look at me and say, Oh, this is the lawyer. I mean, sure people don't look at a young, young Asian woman and go, like, oh, this is the engineer or whatever. Yeah. Susan, Susan did you want to ask something? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a question. I want to shout out something um, about the future, and we can take it however we want. Um, I just uh, spent the fall attending a, a, some really intense conferences um, uh, about cognitive development in the first thousand days. And I just want to share with you all, I was in conferences and talk rooms. We're talking about gender identity and infancy. We're talking about these things really early. So I just want to say that, you know, people there, I just, for me, this is very positive and very hopeful that a conversation about supporting somebody being who they are is starting that early. So if, if we think that what we're talking isn't having an effect on many levels, I just wanna say, I'm hearing conversations at places I would never have thought, you know, and I, I, I just wanted to shout that out because surprise. There is <laughs> no. Or, Portia? Yeah. Two small things to add. Um, you know, I, I have a nine-year-old, right? Daughter, her name's Lucy. And just for hope for the younger generation, right? Uh, there's a three stops, right? Three stop signs near our house. People frequently run one of them. So I'm always extra cautious there. And um, someone ran it and I went, she must be having a really bad day to completely miss that stop sign. And my daughter in the back seat goes, you don't know their pronouns. Right. You don't assume. <laughs> and I went, you're right. I'm sorry. I should not have assumed. I don't know their pronoun. You're right. Who am I to look at somebody and assume something that central to their identity? She's eight, right? Yeah. She's nine. Nine. Right? Yeah. She's nine. So, right. And yes, we started that work early. Red, in case any of you need a picture book, there's a picture book read about a crayon, right? That was very useful in talking about gender and who you are inside and outside. They're labeled red, but the actual crayon is blue. It's it's a it's a very nice picture story. It right. Um, I forgot the author because it's been a couple of years, but it's great. The second thing is, uh, I hear you, Cheryl, I used to go into theaters often, and people would ask me when the lighting designer was going to get there. <laughs> and I would go, oh, I don't know. And I would sit, right? I would sit and I would just watch what was happening, right? Until eventually, like, oh, it's my actual call time. I'm actually supposed to be here. And then I would get up and introduce myself, because they always took me as the assistant. They're like, oh, the assistant has arrived. But when is the actual lighting designer going to be here? And I'm like, it's me. And I'm just like, if that's how you're going to start this with me, right? We're just, we're not going to have a great time together anyhow. So I might as well just sit and wait until I actually have to be useful. Right? Because what, like, yeah. I'll just say it about theater, right? That theater, at least design in my experience, and I'm only going to speak for myself, is often so painful and stressful and suffering right? For so little in return sometimes that I often wonder, like, when I talk to students, because I facilitate a bunch of, you know, intro to anti-racism and that sort of course for folks, how do I tell them to go into theater in good conscience, right? I'm often like, how do I tell, how do I tell young women of color to go into theater where people will say awful things to them? awful things will happen. And I hope they don't, right? I really sincerely hope for the younger generation, they do not happen. But you know, I had one black that's, woman, right? She asked cool. me, should I do summer stock in the, we'll just say in the middle of nowhere. And I said, you know, I've done summer stock in the middle of nowhere. You need to carry pepper spray or mace and you need to learn how to use it effectively. And she went, oh my God, have you ever had to use it? And I'm like three times. I've had to use it to like protect myself three times. So yes, you need to have some sort of self-defense class. You need to have something to defend yourself. So I don't know how we, right? Like, I, I don't know how to tell people to keep going in theater when the pathway is often 
lower paid summer stock, right, as a designer, and then you might do some assisting, you might do this. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell people to suffer anymore, right? Because I don't want to certainly anymore, right? And if I'm still at the point where company managers have forgotten me, so I'm standing outside of a strange apartment building in a strange city at 1 a.m. because they forgot to leave me the key, I can't imagine what it would be like for the intern coming in from a strange city, yeah. right? I'm just sorry. That was a lot, and now I'm going to stop. I that's promise. Very important. Yeah. That's a very important discussion, and it's uh, personal, and it affects a lot of people. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. I think that's very important to say that. What, yeah. what I wonder is, are there different dangers in different different professions? I mean, uh, you've very clearly laid out what's going on in, in, in theater and the arts. Uh, corporate America is, is it is it any better for, for our, our, our I think it's different I think we live at the theater we leave at night we come in the morning especially in in her in, in her world of, of teching you know tech week and, and design and all of that where you're going to come and watch a couple of runs and you're going to re, you know be there for the opening production meeting and then after that you're just there during tech pretty much in preview so she, it's late late at night there's things that can happen i agree i can understand very much what you're saying i was at a we had a latinx um event recently at strasburg and uh one of the uh, repertorio espanol came and they spoke to to the students i was so excited to get the students to meet with repertorio it's a wonderful theater company in new york if you don't know them and um i, I have friends who were involved and one of the um People said, a young, a young man said, I'm a designer and I'm from Chile and I'm concerned about working in New York. And he said, come to Repertorio, you know. But he basically said, find your, find your company. So, I mean, he was saying, try to work in a company like that because that's at least a place to start. You know, if you want to be with, you know, like-minded people and, and feel that you have, uh, you're accepted and comfortable before you go out into the rest of the world. I don't know. It's just something to think about, you know, trying to find your find your niche, find your world that you want to be part of. Find your way in. And safety. Like. Yeah, find your way in and find the safety in that world and go from there. Find your tribe. Yeah, find your tribe, exactly. That's why I never left New York. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is the city, man. I never. I feel comfortable here. I was like, I'm good. I, I, I know who the uh, murderers are. I'm sorry. You know where the bodies are buried. Yeah. <laughs> Patricia, did you raise your hand? Were you trying to raise your hand before? Oh, okay. No? Oh, okay. I thought it was. Never mind. Wow. Good conversation. This is great. Yes. Yeah. We're beyond gender parity. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's it's Thank also you. and I mean, to have people in Portia's position. I certainly understand the leeriness of advising people to go into women to go into this industry, but also to have women who know the way the ground is yeah to be able to give somebody the practical advice of like you're going to need pepper spray or if this happens to you do that kind of thing and i think that's where older women women yeah. well, not just older but women with more experience in the area can advise you i mean in days of me too it was that before pre me too it was kind of like stay away from him never be right. in a room alone with him. absolutely right uh now ideally you can just report the bastard but yeah. Even just to let women, other women know the situations to like maintain, help them maintain their personal safety. Judy. Right. Um, yeah, uh, Portia, your experience is the last of those terrible experiences. It's amazing. Um, how long ago was that? And what part of the country was it? Each in? time? Just the last one. I mean, what year? The very last one? Yeah, how long ago it was, was 20, it? 20, that was the summer of 2017. And I was in the northern Midwest because I feel like if I say the town, you'll all know the theater. And the theater didn't right like the theater didn't do it. So right, I don't want to name them because that would be that'd be mean. I just didn't know, you know, like if it was like ten years ago, maybe things had gone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's also just a thing about treating your people well, right? That like, sure, if I had gone home right after the production meeting, someone might have given me a ride. But I have to stay for notes, right? Or I have to stay because the director wants to talk to me after the production meeting. And, oh, look, the scenic designer has a question, right? right? And then suddenly it's 1.30 in the morning and I'm walking two miles to housing by myself. Right. right. 
right? So, you know, it's also that thing of just, you know, I, I often just say to theaters that like, it's not enough to get underrepresented folks to come design for your theater. How are you going to support them? Yeah, great. Right? Great. How are, are you going to tell them that, by the way, the sandwich shop down the road is racist? Like, don't don't go there. Right? Because some theaters will, right? Some theaters will tell you, like, listen, you you do not want to go to that sandwich shop. They're going to be awful to you, and there's a better sandwich that way. Right? But I, I worry sometimes, particularly about designers and tech folk, that many theater companies don't think those folks need to be developed in any way. That we just come in ready-made, right? That, like, and we're so interchangeable that, like, does it really matter who you are? as long as you can design something. And I would argue often that like, we bring our lived experiences to whatever we design. You might not see it, right? Like, I'm not sure you could look at one of my lighting designs and say, oh, well, obviously she's half Filipino, right? Like, how would you get that from lights, <laughs> right? Like when I put up a gobo that says like, this designer is half Filipino, right? Like there's no way to know that, but I feel like I bring that to yeah. the theaters, for instance, my first show coming back from the pandemic, not that we're over the pandemic, let me be clear. Yes. Right. My first show back in a theater after 2020, you know, I, I said to my team on my headset, I said, listen, theater takes a lot from us. We miss holidays. We miss birthdays. We miss family. But it's not going to take our joy. So we are going to have fun on this headset. We're going to work. Right. We're going to get the show up. There's going to be cues. But we are going to have joy because I can't let it take my joy also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so that part of me, I would say, is maybe bringing that side of my life to the theater. Mm -hmm. Right. But did I feel empowered to do that before 2021? No, we sometimes had dance parties in aisles. Right. But <laughs> right. But it, I didn't explicitly say why. I was just like, and now we're going to dance to Beyonce. Right. And. <laughs> That, it's my tech table, so right, you all can deal with it. All right, Portia, I, Portia, I have to say, I'm so glad that we decided to take a chance and, and use a, a panelist on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. 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 wasn't yeah. sure, wasn't sure it was going to happen. It was going to happen, but it's great. Yeah, it's great having you. It is great. Now, also, Portia, I did want to say that there are things that uh, situations like uh, when black actresses who I'm I'm thinking of TV now. Who have to do their own hair because mm -hmm. they're under black hairstylist makeup. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking in terms of lighting. I think it was insecure where people were pointing out the yeah. lighting of the uh, characters of color right. was so right. much better than just like the, because they knew you, what they were doing. It, yes, mm -hmm. and there has to be an awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the more you can develop that kind of awareness, and people of color are going to be like, well, I need to be lit differently than Lorca does. It's just a fact. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and certainly telling people that there's not just like a list of gel colors, right? Yeah. Like often students will write me and be like, Portia, I have to light Asian people for the first time. Tell me which gel colors to use. And I'm like, that's not how that works, right? There's not like, here, here's the list for Asian folks and here's the list for white folks, right? Like that, that's not how any of this works. You have to like look at people, which is why when I do shows, I always ask for headshots, right? Like. I really want to know who the actors are, not just for the headshot, but frankly, so I can go look them up and try to see them on video and be like, okay, their undertones are like this. So I should stay away from that color because I'm going to make them all look ill. Right. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's how I approach my work. But there, you know, I've noticed more and more often, particularly at universities, that people are like, well, are you telling us then that all the white men should leave lighting design? And I'm like, I didn't say that. Right. I didn't say yeah. that. Yes, yes. I did yeah. say that you have a responsibility from your place of privilege to look at what you do and look at what jobs you take. Right. I think, you know, people have asked like, oh, should I only do shows about white men then? And I'm like, well, if you only did shows about white men, you have a huge catalog. Right. Massive catalog you could do if you decided to do that way. If I decided to do that. Mm, let's see, let's find a half Filipino, half Irish show. I'm sure there's one somewhere, right? But it doesn't work that way. I'm just saying you have to know what you're doing. And I ask people now, like when they ask me to do shows, why me? 
right? Is it because you need a woman of color on the design team, right? Is it because you like my research, which although is linked to my art, it's not exactly the same thing, right? It's a database and I make pretty charts. Well, hopefully they're pretty, I don't know. Judy's are prettier um, and Martha's, yeah. right? There's a, they're, they're just graphically more pleasing, um, I'll say. Not that I'm jealous. Right, a little jealous, Judy, because I can see your face. So I'm like, yeah. really jealous how pretty they are. Because uh, I don't know how to make mine that pretty. Martha where was I going? Too. Somebody stop me. Does someone <laughs> know where I was going? <laughs> I was going somewhere. But I honestly have no clue where. What was I doing? So, I have a thought for you. Is there a way to, I know someone who um, is in an industry where they share information. Um, who's safe to work for, who's not safe to work for, uh, complications that have happened. It's a young model. And they have apparently in the modeling industry now for people that don't have an agent, they have this some kind of you know, Yelp, if you will, <laughs> that kind of idea. I'm just thinking, how does one do that anonymously? Because obviously you don't want to say you can't out a company and then, you know, but I don't know. There's got to be some way to to share the knowledge that you're having, that you're experiencing with people. I don't I mean, know. Right. Some of it's social media, right? That like, no. you know, there's private Facebook groups that I'm a part of that Right. We're there all we women of color designers. And Good. have you Good. ever gotten an offer from this person? What are they like to work with? Yeah. Right. Okay. But it's also the informal mentoring, right? Often people ask me to be a part of formal mentoring programs. And I'm like, listen, no, because I'm not going to sit through all the webinars, right? I'm not trying to be mean about it, but like, please don't make me sit through more webinars than I already have to. Okay. And two, people find me. Right. I find women of color designers, particularly in lighting, but some in other fields, they find me. And then I, from my place of relative privilege, give them my time. Right. So do other designers. Right. White male designers find me all the time. And I go, listen, my experience is so different than what yours might be. I am probably not useful to you as a mentor. You, you need to go find someone else. I don't say this, but in my head, I go other people need me more than you. So I'm going to go give time to them. Yeah, good. Right. So it's that division of like, you know, if you're a white guy, you get an email from me. If you're a white woman, you get 30 minutes on Zoom. If you're a man of color, you get an hour on Zoom. You're a woman of color, you get as long as you want on Zoom until we have to leave. <laughs> right. And then we email after that or Zoom more. Right. You're the best. Yeah. I'm hiring you, Portia. <laughs> oh, don't. Trust me, I'm a pain in the neck to work with. It's like, don't do it. Judy? Um, Judy. Two things I, I, I want to uh, say. First is um, for Portia and everybody who's listening, those charts, those beautiful charts are Martha's. <laughs> so um, she's the one. Um, but once one thing I two things I want to say. One is that um, a lighting designer and I had spoken a few years ago, uh, a well very well known lighting designer who did a, does a lot of um, guest lecturing in various colleges throughout the country, and she said whenever she is there, she gives her card to all the kids and says, "Be sure to you know if you're in New York or you have information." Uh, need information or just want to come and, and meet uh, with me, I'm come, don't be shy. And she said that the only people who, there are a lot of people who do contact her, but the only people who do are men. No women have, she's never been contacted by a woman, which I, I have found astounding. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I may have the answer to that. Good. I think it's imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And there is a lack of training and insight on how to navigate a relationship like that. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's, and you see that's that across industries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Across, yeah. 100% across yeah. industries. Yeah. Um, you see, 
across the industry. industry. It's not just related to theater. Yeah. And um, young men are trained. Or it's more. It's an easier instinct to reach out for yeah. mentorship. There, and and there's there's a common language that that is known. Mm -hmm. I would say the other group besides women are um, people of color mm -hmm. that are first generation. Um, first generation, definitely. First generation who just are not, they don't grow up in uh, a society where you're taught the etiquette of networking, taught the etiquette of um, the 10, 10 second elevator, elevator mm -hmm. pitch. So that's why um, I'm, and if you're not a pushy person like me, um, you're not necessarily pushy. Pushy? What? <laughs> um, you, you, you may not. You may not. You may not. You may not do it. You know. For me, I I just really wanted this. Yeah. So I was like, by you know any any means necessary. That was my experience. Which is why I found Bob like 25 years ago. Um, and here we are. So that's my answer to that, Judy. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's just, you know, I think about, I, I came to New York in 1967 and from K Kentucky, where I was supposed to be a teacher or a secretary and um, was very timid. And yet I, I had fallen in love with the lighting of Tom Skelton. And uh, a friend of mine told me that he was, he was lighting a show during our winter break. And I just called to see if I could possibly come and watch him focus. And he, I had, had assisted on a couple of little off-Broadway shows while I was in school. Uh, and and um, I, so in those days, we took focus notes on legal pads. And um, so anyway, so we were talking and the electrician came to get him and he handed me the legal pad. And he said, well, I have to go to work now. And I said to myself, why is he handing me the legal pad? I guess he wants to, me to take focus notes. And I didn't ask her, I didn't even think about it. it I'd never thought about it in terms like you with Melini, you know, by any means necessary or anything like that. I just thought, oh, I guess he wants me to do that. And uh, by the end of the night, he hired me for the rest of the week for my first Broadway show. And um, so I hear this, these stories and it's like, Everybody, it just seems like everybody has gotten so, um, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, uh, this is, you know, our we take, take our move and our do this instead of just it, it, as, a, as a just sort of an organic way of, you know, calling people and asking. And um, most people will say no. And somebody will say yes, and that's how you start. But it just it's it just seems like everybody's so uptight about it all now. Um, I, I think that's a good point though yeah. about women mm -hmm. that we tend to be uh, still often mm -hmm. I don't want to use the word subservient, or, but mm -hmm. there's this sort of yeah, like a hesitation. Yeah, there's yeah. a hesitation, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that we were going to address actually with this pay equity study. Uh, based on whatever outcomes we start to see to try to set up some you know one-on-one -on -one workshops or or how do i how do i negotiate a salary or how do i have a conversation about getting a raise or um yeah because i think that's so important and something we really need as as a gender um not just women but i know specifically women for the league of professional theater women that's our focus so i do know that that's something that we need to learn not we, I don't necessarily need to, but many people need to learn how to do that for themselves, yeah. how to advocate for themselves. Yes. And I think the more data will also help, not just generally uh, in terms of advocacy and helping people, but also as you realize you're not alone. Yes. It's not that they're not paying me what I'm, it's not that they're not paying me well because I suck. It's because the women generally aren't getting paid as well as men. And then you realize like, oh, well, if it's not just me, then maybe there is something that can or should be done about this. Well, we're actually at a, a time now. Uh, yeah. We have to wrap up. We talked about a lot of things yes. <laughs> tonight. Um, gender, gender parity was in there. <laughs> it was, it was. I, I really love how we established early on the, the intersectionality yeah. and other issues are related. 
yeah. Yeah. just to talk about yeah. the two the two camps alone and how they fight right. each other it wouldn't be enough. Do we do you get each get a final word? Yes, I, wanted to, I was going to say. Great, great. Well, I just do you want to give your final. Well, word? it's just it's just that you know I know we, we we're talking about stories. Um, mm -hmm. There are stories in data. <laughs> the Women Count Project mm -hmm. continues, and I'll make sure you. I mean, you can find it by looking up their other projects called Women Count, but Women Count and Theater will get you. If you searched on that, you would get to the report series and on the landing page where the reports are. But I also wanted to mention um, that Portia and Judy and I and about um, 15 other people and other data projects are involved in a consortium that was initially brought together by Todd London. And we should talk as your data project yes. kind of continues on. Um, it's called Counting Together. Uh, Todd is, London's. Is Todd still at Drama? Um, I think he's. Or he was really, Drama Guild. Was Trump, he was Guild, a Dramatist yeah. Guild, but I don't. I don't think he's there anymore. But he's. he's no, not Dramatist Guild. Guild. He's uh, the other one. New Dramatist. New Dramatist. Uh, no, yeah. he's no longer Dramatist yeah. Guild. Um, uh, but he's still involved in this project, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a consortium of data projects thinking, like, what are what are the joint stories we can help people understand in the data that we are already we are all. Um, assembling um, that are telling the story of a theater from all these different perspectives, productions and focusing on design. Apun Bandu from um, a yeah. APAC um, is now, Judy, this is new news, is we're going to have a triumvirate of co-conveners. <laughs> Todd had to step back. Um, I and Apun and um, Luis Castro, who's affiliated with both the drums, well, the drums with the league and a couple of different places will be co-convening, continuing to co convene the group. So Portia and Judy, it's not dead. It will continue on. Um, you'll, we'll be getting an email to, to meet together. But it's not just for us, we have a website now. But our goal, one of the goals, is to bring in new folks and new projects that Great. are addressing um, theater, theater data and telling stories about the experience of folks at theater. Uh, and uh, but. Um, but also to uh, tell the stories together and to think about, it's, it's for us to think through, not just to tell people how to write about our data, but to think together about assist, how to assist journalists and others who may want to look at these data. Right. Uh, and they can get to it through the portal of our website. This will take you to, link you to the projects. But how can we help come up with some of the stories that are many different projects are talking about? So. Collaboration is the name of that game. A lot That's of work, too. Yeah. Um, Portia, did you want to say anything in conclusion? You've said a lot. <laughs> I've said a lot, but um, it's not really in conclusion. It's just two little things from my work as a facilitator. Uh, I'll often ask groups, right, like when they're introducing themselves, I'll say your pronouns if you're comfortable sharing, right? So it leaves the door open for people to share if they want to, but it also leaves the door open to not. Um, and there was something else from the facilitator land. Facilitator land, right? This is the many hats thing, like how many hats? Um, that, you know, I'll just say with, right, with now, um, like I, I try really hard not to use the language of like, this person has changed their pronouns so much as I tend to say like, this person has come into the fullness of themselves oh, and great. now uses, blank pronouns, right? It just makes it, um, it makes it more human focused, if that helps anybody in the room. And that was it. It's a big learning curve, curve for a lot of people. And again, conversation is, is one thing that we're doing here, and that's helpful. Conversation helps awareness, which is the next step that I think is very important in, in addressing any issue, this issue or any issue that, that we're dealing with in our country. Um, Malini uh, and, and Lorca, any final words? For me, it's really about continuing to be a voice for others who don't have a voice. And that indie theater is really an opportunity to tell your own stories and always set Broadway as a goal because we can always do better and we should always strive high. Um, but it's not the only art. It's the, not the only place to tell stories. And as a, as a woman of color and who, you know, I can't believe I'm getting older, but that there's this whole generation, or two, I know, yeah. <laughs> generations of, yeah, I'm um, the oldest one up here. <laughs> of young people oh, 
behind us <laughs> that we have to just, we have to carry. We have to lead the way, even with all of the, um, you know, just with all of the inequities and what we've had to deal with, we, we have to let them know, like, this is what it is so that they can make that change. So that's, that's how I feel. Okay. Great. Yeah. This is a great panel. Very exciting, right? And inspiring. And I think that's the key. Stay inspired, you know. But um, I think the takeaways for today, for me, are that conversation, having a conversation yeah. with people, um, letting people know who you are. Uh, if you're comfortable self-identifying as to who you are, I think it's helpful to all of us involved. I think um, we all have responsibility. Um, and I think as people who have been in this industry a long time, myself included, that we are responsible to mentor. And I think that that as unofficial as that may be, you know, it doesn't have to be an official mentorship, but just to give back and pass on and keep fighting the fight. Yeah. yeah. And Cheryl, last word for you. Oh, goodness. Um, that I would uh, say that there are things, we have power. I think we have power individually, we have so much power more collectively, but we have power to help make things change. And even though you think, well, I'm just a playwright and I don't have a lot of work to do, uh, how can I help if I, I can't give away any of these writing jobs? Well, but there's gonna be people who like, I need a lighting designer, I need a composer, I need stuff that you might not be able to do, but you can recommend another woman for another gig. And I think just to bear in mind and be aware of how you can help. And I truly do believe that the charity comes back to you. I think there's a sense of karma. And, and it feels good. good. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Portia, Martha, Lalini, Lorca, and Cheryl, my, my partner. <laughs> my partner. <laughs> In crime. Um, can we announce uh, Vaguely, what we're doing in January? Uh, well, what we want to do is we've we've been trying to have a town hall focused on uh, getting BIPOC plays out there. Ironically enough, we were going to focus wanted to focus on Asian American theater. We think great oh. K-pop is on Broadway, and then K-pop is not on Broadway. Well, <laughs> they should come but I think that's what the goal is now to try to hopefully get people. Hopefully they will be willing to talk about that experience. Yes. That is what we want to do. Maybe David so, will come. That would be great. Yeah. So let's just say if you I get like, you do? Yep. Oh, that's fine. So that's what the plan is for January, everybody. So mm -hmm. I hope you'll join us again in January. And, and you all know that we do every Friday at 5 o'clock, except for this Friday because it's Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do our true community gathering, which is an hour conversation on Friday afternoon between 5.30 and 6.30. Um, where we just try to cover anything and everything that we can talk about that has to do with what we do and why we're here in this business. Um, so I welcome everybody to join us. I welcome uh, everybody who's here tonight, everybody who's on Zoom, and also when this eventually goes on YouTube, YouTube viewers, <laughs> hope you'll come and be a part of the community as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Sandy you. For all the work. Thank you to the Palmyris Theater yes. and to Rosemary Grand Wine, and thank you to my guests. And that's it. Bye, everybody. Bye. And this, Bye. Is where, this is where I'll, this is where I'll